our friends gather with us. And so I just want to go over a few housekeeping items that we mentioned them earlier. Um, if you would give us the honor of muting yourself, um, that way we aren't hearing what's going on at your house. <laughs> um, and so in order to do that, that's going to look like on your computer screen. You're going to see a little uh, microphone, and you just want to click it and make sure there's a slash through it. Or on your um, home phone or your cell phone, however you normally would mute it. Um, so you can only hear the person talking, and they wouldn't be able to hear you. We're going to go ahead and ask um, that you do that uh, for this call. I do want to say there will be time uh, for questions and answers. And so if that comes up, um, by all means, unmute yourself. Um, I'd love to uh, hear your questions. Question, uh, chances are that if you're thinking it, it or you have a question about it, someone else uh, probably has a question about it as well. And so we would love the opportunity to answer that. And I have to say, um, I'm really excited about the call tonight. Uh, we have been very particular um, in what we want to share with you. And so with that said, I hope you'll be really, um, you know, plugged in and good listeners. Knowing that Na National Collection Week, man, it's just a few weeks away. It tends to be the Super Bowl for us. Um, and so, again, uh, let's just give, you know, this time to the Lord and see what he might have for us to learn about our role and what it means to be, you know, a part of the logistics network with Operation Christmas Child. And so, um, again, I I'm hearing a bit of feedback. Um, and so just triple check, make sure you mute it yourself so that we don't know how to get started. All right, let's dive in. So you are officially a part of the um, Southeast Logistics Conference Call for 2018. Give yourselves a round of applause. Um, it's a really exciting uh, role to be a part of. And so what I want to highlight briefly um, is the bigger picture of our drop-off locations throughout the U.S. So without our drop-off locations and central drop-off locations, donated gospel opportunities they wouldn't make it in the hands of our ministry partners overseas. And this year alone, we're praying for 1,060,000 shoebox gifts to pass through the hands of our, logis our logistics network in the Southeast region. That's a lot of boxes handled by your team members at your drop-off locations. And for nationally, we are praying for an 11 million plus shoebox year. And so, Real quick, I want to take um, a moment and highlight what the logistics network looks like on the other side of the box. So you'll see uh, by bike in Uganda. Imagine convincing your team to do that. And you'll see um, by foot and feet. But we know that God is not just doing ministry on that side of the box. He's doing ministry on this side of the box as well. And one of my favorite accounts of a missional drop-off location is that um, of a, a central drop-off who really put in the effort to be transformational so that when their donors came, they really would have um, a missional experience. And so in this particular drop-off, um, a woman and her father enter the drop-off to uh, bring a donated gospel opportunity. And uh, the drop-off team leader starts chit-chatting them up. And she had recognized the daughter, but not necessarily the father. And she was able to walk them through uh, the journey of a shoebox. What happens after it leaves their location? How does it end up in, our, in the hands of ministry partners overseas? And after spending time with them and really engaging the donors, she offered them uh, the opportunity to go to the processing center uh, with that church. And so this man, Bill, and his daughter uh, went to the processing center. He got a full, uh, you know, grasp of the ministry and what it means to be a part of the ministry. And uh, the job mm -hmm. leader brags um, of what God has done by bringing Bill to their church. Um, he now attends that church. And just to see God's intentions for ministry on this side of the box. I like to say all the time, God cares just as much about the four-year-old man down the street as he does about uh, the young child in the Philippines who doesn't know him. Like, we're all mm -hmm. precious at the time. 
And so there's value in the work that we're doing on this side of the box just as much as there is on the other side of the box. And so what I want to do right now is talk about what we're going to be covering uh, during this logistics call. Again, we're going to be covering a lot of ground, so it's important that you really are, um, are attentive. Um, and like my kindergarten teacher used to say, have your listening ears on. So we're going to talk about what needs to happen before your National Collection Week prep meeting. We're going to talk about what needs to happen during your NCW prep meeting. We're going to talk about some changes to the freight industry and what that means for our logistics network. And then we're going to bring about some uh, reminders for our central drop-off team leader as far as paperwork and closure packets um, are concerned. So with that, I want to introduce you to my friend, uh, Shelly Wishard. Hello, everybody. I'm only going to keep my video on for a second, just for obvious reasons. I'm fresh out of a workout, and nobody wants to look at this for very long. But I did just want to say hello to everybody, and um, thank you so much for joining the call. It's such a privilege for us to be able to share this information with you. And similar to what Tricia said, you know, our heart is to make all of these millions of details that make National Collection Week work just as easy and streamlined for you as we can. So our prayer has been for this call that we can do that for you. Um, so I'm going to shut my video off. Good to see you all. And I will carry on with, with what I'm talking about. So I'm going to talk to you all this evening just briefly about what needs to happen before your NCW prep meeting. So the first thing that you'll see on the screen is promote your meeting, which may seem kind of obvious since our meetings are just in a couple of weeks. So hopefully, and I'm, I feel certain that all of you have promoted it by this point. The reason that we're making this point is just a reminder to, to really promote this meeting as early in the year as possible. And we're going to talk about that um, in just a minute. Tracy will cover that a little bit more fully. But this is actually. It, I think the only mandatory meeting that we have in our volunteer ministry with Operation Christmas Child. Um, this is a meeting that because of its importance and because of the importance of National Collection Week, and really quite frankly because of the amount of detail that goes on, we ask anybody who's going to serve as a drop-off location to be at this meeting. And if for some reason they can't be there, then we ask them to send a representative. And if they can't do either of those things, then we ask that they don't serve this year because it's that important for them to be there to get this information. So with that said, if we're going to require people to be there, we want to give them as much notice as we possibly can because you all know how difficult it is to coordinate schedules. So um, just a reminder to be sure to promote your meeting early and not only to promote your meeting to your drop off team leaders and your logistics network, but we really do consider National Collection Week an all hands on deck experience. So we encourage you to invite your entire area team. If you're in an active area with an area coordinator, definitely invite all of your promotional team members and um, different leaders in the ministry. And if you're in a developing area without an area coordinator, you can talk to your regional point of contact to make sure you have all the information for the other members of your team. But it's a great time to get the whole team together, get everybody involved in what's happening. So the next thing you want to do before National Collection Week prep meeting is prepare for your cartons. And we sent an email out on Wednesday, I believe, as a reminder for this meeting, and it had all of the information for your carton shipments. Now, those are coming from two different locations, ABF and United. And so you should have gotten those, and those documents are excellent. It should have everything that you need for your carton delivery. Um, who to call if they don't call you, when you should expect their call, how much notice or lead time they're going to give you. That all should be included there. And what was also included in that email was a spreadsheet that Wendy put together for us that has all of your locations um, listed out and how many cartons you're going to be getting and how much tape you're going to be getting. So that was one spreadsheet that listed the number of cartons and the number of rolls of tape. And that's a spreadsheet you want to have handy when you are going to be receiving your delivery because you want to make sure that you're signing for the correct amount of cartons and the correct amount of tape. And if you don't aren't getting that amount, don't sign for it and call your regional point of contact and we'll figure out what's going on. 
Then you also received a spreadsheet that actually has what we call a cart and allotment suggestion for each of your locations. So you can find your logistics network on that spreadsheet and it'll have all of your drop-off locations listed and it will have our recommendation or suggestion for how many cartons each location should receive. Now, just a, a note, that's just a suggestion because we know that you know things locally that we may not know. And so you can always adjust the number that you give to each location, but that's just a guide to kind of get you started, a springboard, so to speak. So hopefully that will be helpful. And then the other thing you'll want to do before your NCW prep meeting is I would highly recommend, and I think most of you do this, go ahead and section out your cartons before the meeting. Have them already prepared. You know, if you've got 80 cartons for um, your location in Grantham, then you put 80 cartons for them. 70 cartons for the next location. Go ahead and have them separated because they're going to ship on pallets and they're going to be a lot of cartons on a pallet. So you'll have to separate those out. And I heard feedback last year, <laughs> just a suggestion for those of you who are new, be sure that you have somebody else scheduled to help you with that because the cartons are kind of unwieldy and can be sort of heavy and they're tall. You know, they, they stack them pretty high. So if you're a short person, you might have difficulty getting the cartons down <laughs> and putting them in stacks. So just make sure that you're prepared and that you have somebody hopefully tall and strong that can help you get those cartons all sectioned out. All right, and then the third thing you're going to want to do, obviously, is prepare for your NCW prep meeting. And Tracy's going to go into more detail there, but I just wanted to share um, that we do have all of the resources available to you in box. And this morning you received an email from us that had a link to our folder. Um, and Box, for those of you who don't know, it's just a simply a web-based tool where it's like a file cabinet where we can keep all of our files. So you should be able to access that link if you want to access the tools um, via computer. And then we also attached all of the resources so that if for some reason you can't get into the link, you can still see all of those resources. And those are something you're going to want to print and make sure that you have for all of your drop-off team leaders at your meeting. And also make sure that you forward those resources to them electronically because we have not sent those resources counting on you to be the liaison to communicate that information with them. And then one last note on your prep meeting as you are getting ready to prepare. You know, we have done a lot to give you a PowerPoint and give you resources, and our goal is to make this, you know, somewhat easy for you and, and not have to put a whole lot of work into it. But we really do want you to put your own spin on this meeting and really make it creative and engaging and fun and informative. And that can look a lot of different ways. So we ask that you cover the content that we've given you to, come to cover. But how you do that, you can be creative and put your own personality into it. And then finally, just make sure as you're getting ready for your meeting that you have communicated to, the, to your team to bring a vehicle large enough to take their cartons. Because I've been at several meetings where somebody came in a Volkswagen bug and it, it just was not going to happen. So just be sure that you communicate that as well. Hi everyone, this is Tracy Bullinger. I'm starting my video in case you don't know who I am. Um, I get the privilege of talking to you about what happens during your National Collection Week meeting. And um, the first thing that I want to point out is that in the years past, if you've been a drop-off team leader, a central drop-off team leader for a couple of years, we usually use this time to go through the PowerPoint that you will present at your meeting. And we decided that this year we could make a better use of your time by not doing it that way. So during your meeting, you will have a suggested PowerPoint. It has already been emailed to you, so you already have access to it. And we really do suggest that you use that. It will help guide your meeting. But like Shelly said, we want you also to make sure that you're being creative and putting your own spin on it. Um, but it's a tool that you have for your use. Um, the second thing that we want to talk about that's happening during your meeting is that we want to make sure you're spending time discussing the core values of NCW. And we do not want this to be like a data dump. We don't want you to just tell them all of the, the core values. We've told them that, you've told them that, they know that. We want you to spend this time during your meeting 
with your drop-off team leaders, having them brainstorm and share ways that they have been transformational or ways they've been prayerful, ways that they have found to be accurate and efficient. So use that time to get them to share during your meeting. Um, the third thing that we want to cover is that we want it to be a, an inviting atmosphere. So that's something that's going to be up to you. I think a great thing that all of you can do is set up a promotional table, and this will be especially helpful for your new drop-off team leaders, to have that table set up, and when your new drop-off team leaders come to the meeting, treat them like a donor. Show them the materials that you have on your promotional table. Engage with them like you would with a donor so you're modeling for them what to do. You can share with them about the greatest journey, about recruitment, about BASMO, all those different things that they'll need to know how to do at their own drop-off location. So think that through. And then another great activity that you can do at your meetings. This year, as you all know, we have larger shoe boxes, cardboard and plastic. And I'm guessing most of us don't know how many shoe boxes fit in that carton. And so you could have a packing contest, have some shoe boxes there, and see how many, cart how many shoe boxes fit vertically in the bottom of that carton using the larger ones. That would be a great opportunity for the drop-off team leaders to experiment and to know how they're going to pack their cartons this year. Um, we've already said that we'd like for you to promote your 2019 National Collection Week prep meeting early. And so what we're saying is we want you to promote it at your meeting this year. So the meeting you have in a couple of weeks, you have all the players there that are going to be participating. Use that time to pick a date now for 2019. The only thing you need to be aware of is that you have to schedule that meeting after October 24th to make sure that you have your cartons in time. But other than that, utilizing the people that are there and having people look at their calendars and being prepared is a great, great way to ensure good attendance next year. So now we're going to move on to um, our expectations for your meeting. And our largest expectation is that you're going to be equipping your network of drop-off team leaders for missionary work on this side of the box. Um, and as a reminder, you know, we definitely want to go over the core values for um, being missional. And um, we decided to do that by inviting some, some of you all to participate in the call at this point. Um, definitely emphasize the importance of being transformational versus transactional. Y'all, we're the Chick-fil-A's, we're not the Burger Kings. We're the ones that go the extra mile, make the donors feel welcome, make the volunteers feel welcome, engage them in what we're doing, showing them the love of Christ and showing them God's love this side of the box. And so we want to make sure that you're doing that. The other thing um, we want to emphasize, of course, is that all drop-off locations should be prayerful. Open each day with prayer and devotion, pray with every donor, even have a visual prayer display. And I've asked Barb Westerbeck from the Alabama-Georgia Wiregrass team. She's going to share her plan for emphasizing prayer at her National Collection Week prep meeting. Barb? Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Two, or, two weeks ago, our team had a prayer event called the Prayer Mosaic, and it was an interactive prayer time. My prayer mobilization coordinator set up six tables, and each table was a specific prayer request over our ministry needs. You could go to any table at any time and spend as much time as you wanted praying over the specific requests for the ministry. Each of the six tables had a different theme. I'm only going to be able to share one theme with you and then I'll share one more thing before we end. The one theme that she had was called the prayer net. She had a large fishing net draped over a table and then in little bins, she had little ties that had green tie and a red tie and a white tie that you would tie to the prayer net. But each tie represented a specific request, like green would represent TGJ. So we would pray specifically for TGJ and the increased participation of it and the pre preparation of the teachers as they taught the classes. And each color for that thread, the threads that she had there, would be a specific request that you would tie to the net. So there was six of these different tables, and I will post each of those different tables and pictures on our area coordinator Facebook page so that you can reproduce it easily yourself. 
But what we're going to do is we had a, we're going to box those table ideas up and ask different churches, of course, to also have prayer mosaics. And we've already had several that are interested in having the prayer mosaic at their church. So easily we have it in a box. We bring the six different tables, we set them up, and we can have that at a, at a location. But for our NCW, we're going to set up two or three of the tables so that logistics people, the drop-off location team leaders can have an idea what it means to be prayerful, how to set up prayer stations at their drop-off location. I'm going to turn on my video because one specific uh, one is really interesting to see, and I'll show it to you. Let me see. Here we go. Oh, can we see? I'm not sure if you can see it. Yes. Can you see me? We can. Okay, so I can't even see myself, but each of my drop-off locations this year will be getting a go box. Inside the go box is something that would be in the go box, like a little matchbox car. And then there's a prayer that goes with the matchbox car about transportation. Each of the little things in there are different requests over our ministry. So my prayer team's been working on 13 of these so that each drop-off location can have one this year for their drop-off location. So that gets them a jump start on the prayer part of the drop-off locations. This is something easily you can do, and it's something that they can transport to different parts. Of it. The kids don't get to keep them. It's really great for kids, but they get to touch it, feel it, and pray over it. And it's a great time to teach them how to pray for our ministry. Thank you. Thanks, Barb. Those are great ideas. You guys are doing a great job. You know, one of our core initiatives in the Southeast region this year is for drop-off locations to be active. We want to see a hub of activity involving the community and providing amazing experience for our short-term volunteers. And so I've asked Suzanne and Brees Quinn from the Northeast Mississippi to share how they involve the community in their central drop-off location. Not sure which one's speaking, Suzanne or Brees or both of you? might need to unmute yourself. Can you guys hear us? Yes, thank you. Okay. Well, we do try to have a missional mindset in everything we do as a CDO. And so uh, in addition to trying to create that welcoming and festive environment for the donors and volunteers, we tried to make sure that we're focusing on ministering to them. And so we... We've been asked to specifically comment on our recruitment and equipping of volunteers. Most of our volunteers are from within our own church, but we're growing the number of volunteers from the community. One way that we involve the community is to have people in the church bring coworkers from their workplace to work a shift with them. And we reach out to students who need service hours to come and work with a friend. And we've also recruited by talking with people from other churches who bring in their shoeboxes and invite them to volunteer and tell people from their church about volunteering at the CDO. Uh, we're very excited to have a growing partnership with one of the other churches here in Oxford that have been sending us more volunteers each year to work alongside us. It's really been a great opportunity to form relationships with other Christians from other churches in the community. And one of the ways that we've promoted a missional environment is in the training of volunteers to understand and embrace the comprehensive vision that OCC has for both sides of the box. So in advance, we ask the volunteers to watch the training video OCC has available and fill out the volunteer hours form. We've had some success with that, but we found that it's really important to monitor the accuracy of those forms. And one of the ways that we ensure training and to promote teamwork is to schedule a 30 minute period of training and prayer at the beginning of each shift before the center opens. Basically, we do a condensed <coughs> version of the National Collection Week prep meeting to share the OCC vision. Then we show them a map and layout of how our particular center is set up, how to volunteer in each area, and then how it all works together. And then they get more specific training afterwards. But we've observed that by doing the training meeting that way, everyone has an opportunity to understand what we're doing as a team to accomplish our mission. The volunteers seem more invested when they understand the long range strategy that OCC has for ministry and how those things work together to grow the ministry and reach more people. And so we just love to hear people excited to learn new things about what OCC does. And we've seen our volunteers be very missional in engaging the donors that come in by praying with them uh, and their needs for their shoe boxes, discussing opportunities to be more involved in the ministry. And as a result, OCC was able to 
recruit a student relations coordinator for the local university because one of our donors signed a sheet for those that were interested in learning more about long-term volunteerism. So we really do want our volunteers to carry a positive ministry experience with them. So we write an end of the year recap letter, thank them for their service, and include one of the keepsake ornaments. So those are some of the things that we've done in those areas, and it's been great to see the volunteers really getting on board and seeing every opportunity as an um, every interaction as an opportunity to bless someone. Thank you both so much. We so appreciate your commitment to being promotional and to really loving on and caring for those short -term, short term volunteers. Um, are being active, I'm sorry. Another initiative this year is to be promotional. And Tom Smith is from the South Central Alabama team and he's going to share his strategy for engaging donors at his central drop-off so that every donor leaves knowing more about the ministry than when they came in. Tom? Yeah, what we do is uh, in your in your packet that you got today, you have a donor engagement talking points and I, that's a fantastic thing. <laughs> When we go out and we meet people at, the, at their cars, at their vehicles, we use those to strike up conversations with them. We bring them in. We get the, the drop-off logs filled out. We pray with them. And then uh, a couple of things we've got in there. We have a photo booth. We have snacks. We have coloring pages. But here's what, what we really, where we really engage them is we have an, what I call an engagement team. And it's myself and it's two or three other people. And these people have a passion for the ministry and they have an understanding of how the big, the big picture of how the whole thing works. And what we do is what I call is tell. Uh, we go through the journey of a shoebox and we focus on the destination. We'll have either a map on the wall with the locations that the shoeboxes are going to this year or where they went in the past years. And if we don't have a map, we'll put placards up there of the names of all the countries that they're going to. And at that point, we, we tell them about follow your shoebox and, and let them know that, hey, if you really want to know where your shoeboxes are going next year, you know, go at Google, follow your shoebox. You can go on there, you can print out tracking labels, and you can follow them. And I'll even pull out my phone and pull up uh, from the app and you can I can show them where my shoe boxes went from 2014 all the way to last year so I'll, I'll show that to them we always share an impact story with them and we let them know that God you know we, we tell them an impact story and we let them know that God knows exactly where every one of those shoe boxes are going and that each one of those shoe boxes really is a missionary unto itself and then we flow into and transition into telling them about uh, The Greatest Journey, which is a 12-week disciple-making program. And we explain to them how that really, uh, for the, the kids to graduate from that, one of the things that they have to do is they have to go share the gospel with uh, 10 other people. So that one shoebox really has multiplied itself into 11 gospel opportunities. And then I'll also tell them that, hey, you know, although it's too late to follow your shoebox and find out where it's going to go this year if you didn't do that, it's not too late to participate in the greatest journey. And if they want to do that, I'll tell them, hey, you can Google follow your shoebox, and on that page right there will be a place that they can go ahead and, uh, and participate in the greatest journey. So then we take them into recruiting, but I'm going to turn that over to Leanne Allison, the area coordinator for the Yazoo Delta team, to talk about uh, sharing year-round volunteer opportunities. Hi, this is Leanne, and uh, I'm with the Yazoo Delta team, and we're a new team, and uh, we started it in 2016. We became a team as a where they split us off from the Jackson area. And as we were gathering, um, collecting shoe boxes, we would just share with them, the people that were donors that would come in that uh, we were trying to grow a team and wanted to collect more shoe boxes and to get more churches involved. And so we just would talk with them and would share with them and that, uh, for them to pray and see if this is where the Lord might be leading them to be become more active uh, as a partner with us with the shoe boxes, and a lot of times it would be the ones the churches that would be bringing the most shoe boxes, and we would talk to them, and we could could tell those who had a passion for it, and um, as 
the beginning of 2017, we were able to add uh, another drop-off team, uh, location. We had two to begin with, and as we talked with these, we were able to share more, and we were able to add a location in 2017. And then, then the next, that collection year, last year, we just continued to share the um that our love for the missions and the uh, just the pa- compassion that we have for shoe boxes and through sharing our love and for the ministry and just talking with the ones that would bring in the shoe boxes we were able to make another connection this spring and at another drop off location with another church so now our team just through the sharing at drop-off time, we have been able, we're up to four drop-off locations in our new team. Thanks, Leanne and Tom. You guys are doing a great job as well. Finally, y'all, it's so important to be efficient and accurate. And I just feel like I'm preaching to the choir here because you all get that so well. But please make sure you share that during your National Collection Week prep meeting with your drop-off team leaders that it's so vital that they be organized and have a plan for ensuring that their drop-off logs match their carton numbers and their summary sheets at the end of every day. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Shelly, and she's going to share with you some exciting changes about the freight industry. Hey again, everybody. Um, I actually do have some new information for you this year. We're finding ourselves kind of navigating a new climate in the freight industry. And I'm not sure how many of you keep up with the freight industry news or know what's happening. I know I do not follow the freight industry. So I want to share with you kind of what's going on in our current economic um, situation. So right now, we're finding ourselves in in a place where there's a a pretty significant uh, driver and trailer shortage in the U.S., um, which of course means just based on supply and demand that there's a high demand and very little supply. And so this is gonna create some challenges for us. And primarily it's going to mean that we're gonna have to be a lot more flexible in the way that we work um, because we do have um, this shortage to deal with. And then in addition to that, we also have had some governmental changes Um, For instance, they're requiring drivers to fill out electronic drive logs that basically restrict the number of hours they can drive in a day. So the drivers themselves are going to be less flexible and less available to us. And so that's going to mean that we're going to need to shift the way that we operate. And so I, I want to say before I get into the details of this that I'm fully aware that each of you have very individual situations and each of you are dealing with a different set of circumstances. So there is no one size fits all to this issue. Um, I think each of you are gonna have to look at your individual situation and make wise decisions on how to handle it. And and we know you are all fully equipped um, to do that. So, um, you know, some of you I think are in, of course, more rural areas. Some of you are in metropolitan. Some of you have great relationships with your terminal managers. Some of you haven't met your terminal managers yet. And so these factors will play into how you handle um, navigating the situation. But I am going to give you just some general guidelines that I think can help you, um, you know, figure out what the best thing is to do with, with the situation. And I think before I get into the specifics, one thing I'd like to share is because of the climate and the way it is, um, we are not a very desirable customer to the freight industry. <laughs> I mean, we never have been, but at least when things, when they needed business, it, it was okay um, to have to cater to us. But we have pretty significant and specific needs. And so, you know, we're not a customer that any trucking industry is really clamoring to get or maintain. And so we're really having to um, do our best to make ourselves a more desirable customer and to be very flexible and accommodating to the freight industry. So here are a couple of suggestions for you. Um, Number one is just to plan better for uh, with your local terminals prior to and during NCW. And I hate to even say better because I think y'all are already planning well with your local terminals, 
I think the key this year is going to be more of really have a very honest and direct conversation with your terminal manager. And I would say even just acknowledge to them, hey, you know, we know that things have changed and we know that we can be a hard customer. So let's work together and let us know how we can work with the situation that you're dealing with. How can we accommodate, you know, your drivers and what you need? And then you can definitely communicate your needs as well, but just let them know that you're willing and able to work with them as much as, as you can. So I think just having that honest conversation, you know, when you meet with them on site will go a long way. The other thing I would suggest, and, and there are two things here. Um, one issue is that they are needing us to have shorter trailer holds on site. So they're asking us to keep the trailers on site for a shorter amount of time. Now, I know for some of you, and in years past, we've welcomed this. You know, some of you, if you need four trailers, you've been ordering them on the first Monday and having them all dropped the same day and keeping them all week long. Well, this year, we're not going to be able to do that, and we're going to need to look for options where we can keep the trailers as short a time on our property as possible. In addition to that, and these two, these two things are, I believe, are a bit conflicting, so I'm going to talk through this a bit. The second thing that's happening is the carriers are, are asking us, if possible, to have them bring an empty trailer while at the same time taking away a full trailer. And, and they've asked us to do this in years past, but I think this year this is going to be even more important. Now, the way I see it, these two things can be at odds with each other because either you have the trailer on your property for a short period of time, meaning that they drop the trailer, you load it, and they take it away the same day, or you keep your trailer until it's full and allow them then to pick up the full trailer while they're dropping off a new trailer. So this is one of those things that you're going to need to have a conversation with your terminal manager about and just see what works better for them. I think you just knowing that these are their issues can help you in that conversation. And you can say, hey, would you rather us, you know, have a trailer dropped and filled and picked back up the same day? Or would you rather us have a trailer, keep it, fill it, and then have a new one brought? So you can have that conversation with them. Now, I think that this particular situation is going to bring up two issues for you. And so these are things that you have a little bit of time to talk to your church leadership about, to, to figure out, to pray through and think through, and even talk to your area coordinator or your regional point of contact if needed. But two things I think you'll have to look at is you're going to, first of all, you're going to need to assess your storage capacity at your church um, as much as possible because they're wanting us to hold the trailers for shorter periods of time. You're going to need to store the cartons somewhere for as long as possible. So have them you know, fill the cartons, have them come in, but because you won't have a trailer there all week long, you won't be able to load them onto the trailer. So it will be a situation where you're going to be looking to figure out where can I store these cartons until I'm, I have enough to f basically fill a full trailer. So that's something you're going to want to look at. And we know that not all of you can accommodate that. So it's just kind of being creative about, okay, how can we make this work? Um, the second thing you're going to want to think about is your manpower. Because if we're wanting to basically load a full trailer one at a time, you're going to need to secure mm. the manpower for the loading of the trailer. So just thinking through, okay, when and how can we get a group of strong we'll men do here to do the loading? And I think maybe uh, some people may have come off mute. So if you don't mind just making sure you're on mute, I'm hearing just a little bit of feedback um, in, the, in the reception here. So, so thinking about your storage and your manpower, I think will be helpful. And then again, just having that good conversation with the terminal manager to see what's, what's possible. And then another thing just to be prepared for because of the driver shortage and because of the, the restriction on the number of hours they can drive, there will probably be a slower turnaround time to get a trailer. So I would highly recommend that you give the trailer um, company 24 hours to be uh, to when you need a trailer so that you can make sure to get one within that time frame. I think in the past, sometimes you've been able to call and get a trailer pretty quickly, 
but I don't believe that's going to be the case this year. So just be prepared for that and plan ahead for that. And then finally, and this has always been the case, um, we just want you to, you know, we, all of us want to treat the drivers and the terminal managers with missional kindness. And, you know, I know in the moment it's easy to get kind of involved in the task and you're kind of stressed and trying to figure things out. But these are folks that, you know, may or may not be believers and they may or may not have experienced the kindness of the Lord. So this is an opportunity for us to demonstrate that to them and to um, really be kind to them and go above and beyond to accommodate them. Um, heard a sweet story last week. I was talking to someone and he was just sharing that, you know, he's prayed over his driver before he asks, you know, he, he asks them, what, how can I pray for you? And they've developed just a really strong relationship and they communicate throughout the year. Um, and so it's a really sweet thing to have developed that. So just be aware that that's a huge evangelistic opportunity for us. And so just be mindful that even in the stress of this whole situation, um, that that really is our desire is that these, these um, precious people would come to know the Lord. So just be thoughtful about that. Okay, so a couple of things just to consider before ordering a trailer, and these are very similar to what we've done in the past. Um, first of all, you're going to want to be familiar with who your transportation carrier is. And we sent an email this morning with the reminder for the call, and it included a doc documents that have all of the shipping instructions listed for you. And these documents are excellent, they're thorough. I think any question you can have about how to order a trailer are answered in these documents. So for those of you who are in Georgia, your carrier is ABF. For those of you who are in Mississippi and Alabama, your carrier is Old Dominion. So just be sure that you print out the right set of instructions and it'll have contact information, process, procedure, all of those things, um, which is really nice. Um, then trailer size options. Uh, we want you to be aware as you're ordering of the different sizes of trailers and what the expectations are there. Most of you are aware that there are three sizes of trailers. There's a 28 foot pup and that can be dropped off on its own. There's what they call a van or a set of pups, which is two 28 foot smaller trailers. And then there's a 53 foot trailer. And so, um, you just want to be aware of that and make sure that you order the right size, which I'll cover in just a minute. Then also be aware that companies bill us per trailer and not by weight. So we want to make sure that your trailers are completely full before you ship them so that we can get the most bang for our buck with those trailers. And so with the size of trailers, if you're with Old Dominion, which is Mississippi and Alabama, they have requested that we use the sets of pups. So you'll, they'll want to be dropping two 28-foot pups for you when you make your request. With ABF, for those of you in Georgia, you can have anything you want and anything that they have available. So there's no um, suggestion there with ABF. And then finally, we want you to be sure to order sealed dividers with your final trailer. That's basically like a piece of plywood that they can seal off um, if your trailer isn't full. And that allows them to put sofas or computers or something else behind our order if we don't completely fill the trailer. But that does have to be ordered before you place the order for the final trailer. So that just means you'll need to be looking ahead and in and, and constant communication with your drop-off locations to kind of get a read on how many cartons you expect to have, and that way you can make a decision before you order that trailer as to whether or not you're going to need the sealed divider. And I would say when in doubt, just go ahead and order it. Um, I think that's it. So uh, because of that's kind of a new situation, I'd love to just give open this up for just a few minutes for questions if you have any specific questions about the changes with the trucking industry. So just remember to take yourself off mute if you have a question you want to ask at this time. Hey, Shelly, this is Kathy Driver. Hey, Kathy. I just want to uh, give you a quick scenario to make sure I understood what you covered. So uh, a, a question for central drop-off. If we usually have five trailers to fit all the cartons for our area and five uh, trucks uh, are packed on the last Monday, 
Are you saying that we would split that up during the week? Actually, no, and, and thank you for giving us a real life scenario. It's kind of a word problem. That's really helpful. So if you have five trailers, I would suggest if you can, I think the ideal scenario would be to you, for you to have all five of them dropped on the final Monday and load them all that day. And that way those trailers are only there for one day or possibly they're dropped on Monday and then picked up on Tuesday. Um, so I think that would be the ideal scenario. It would just mean that you would have to store the cartons throughout the week somewhere in your building and then have a ton of manpower there the final Monday. Okay, thank you. Sure. <laughs> This is Lori Knutson. I have a question. Hey, Lori, sure. Go ahead. All right. Um, regarding what she just said, let's pretend that um, we get a lot of <clears throat> drop-offs from larger parties at the very beginning of the week. Would it be all right to have a trailer <coughs> Excuse me. at the very beginning of the week, have it completely full, and then have it um, picked up the next day. So it's only there for one day. Um, but And then when we have our slow period during the week, wait and get our final trailer on the last Monday. Is that an acceptable scenario? Yes, absolutely. And so um, just to kind of share a little bit more information about that, I think the key is, like you said, keeping it there for as short a period as you can. And so, yes, absolutely. If you've got a lot of cartons and you're ready to fill a trailer, have it dropped, and then they can pick it up that same day or the next day. So just trying to shorten the amount of time you have the trailer on your lot. All so, right. So, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Sure. All right. For the sake of time, I didn't give you all much time to ask questions, but I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Wendy. Um, so that we can finish all the information. And then just know that we're here for you. If you have questions about your particular situation, um, feel free to reach out to your regional point of contact and we can you know, help you think through particular situations. All right, thank you, Shelley. So this is Wendy Kaufman. I'm the admin coordinator for the office. And I wanna start with just saying two quick things. One, I was very blessed to hear the volunteers that shared earlier tonight. That was so encouraging to hear um, what is happening out in the field. And then also, just to speak to you all, if you've been on this call in the past few years, you've heard me speak a lot about closure packets and accuracy. And I just wanna tell you, I have been so blessed and encouraged, and especially this last season, because I have seen you all consistently raise the bar every year that I've been here. And I'm just so thankful for your partnership that you've heard what I've been saying and why I've been saying it, and you've really risen to the occasion. So I just wanna take a moment tonight to go over a few pointers and important things for this season. And the first thing I wanna start with is three important dates that um, you're going to want to make note of. So the first one is on Tuesday, November the 20th, is an email that needs to come to the regional office with your final CDO network total. And that is very important that we get it on Tuesday because we have to report it to headquarters that day as we're trying to balance and make sure that no trailers are missing, everything and everyone is accounted for. The second important date is Wednesday, November the 21st. That is the date that closure packets must be shipped by to the um, using the address label that you'll receive with um, a mailing from headquarters. And so please get your closure packets shipped by the 21st so that I get them in time for me and my team to process them. And then the final date is Wednesday, November the 28th. That's the date that the combined Excel drop-off logs need to be emailed to the regional office. Uh, you'll see that we're asking the drop-offs in their PowerPoint to get their information to you the, the day after um, collection week ends, either the 20th or the 21st, so that you have a week to get that compiled, with taking account for the fact that the Thanksgiving holiday is in there. So please get that to us um, by the 28th. And you'll see a, a request on how to label the subject line of your emails. If you can please note that 
that you include what it is and what your central drop-off name is because there's 59 um, central drop-offs that are going to be sending me at least three emails apiece, and that's 177 emails. So anything you can do to help me with that is appreciated. There is in the packet that came in the email today and in box a closure packet cheat sheets um, section that I really want to point out because all of these dates are on a cover sheet that's in that with some important tips and pointers to help make your closure packet process as simple as possible. And it also includes some sheets with examples of how to complete them and some important, and some important tips on those as well. I just think that'll make things a lot smoother for you. So moving on from that, um, continuing to touch a little bit on the thought of closure packets is the concept of accurate information and how important the accurate information is. To give you an idea, I'm going to receive closure packets from over 390 individual central drop-off and drop-off locations this year. And I have a small team, and we have two weeks to turn it around while we're also helping to manage things at the processing center. Accurate information is going to make this process so much smoother, not just for my team, but headquarters has to account for so much of this information because we are a nonprofit ministry. We have to account for the numbers. We have to account for the volunteer hours. We are accountable to people with these things. And so the more accurate information that you give us, the better job our ministry can do overall of reporting this information to the powers that be. Um, one of the things to point out for this year is, again, the traditional drop-off log form is to be completed by every donor. If you've been with us in years gone by, um, we haven't been doing the past participating drop-off logs for a couple years now. That is, again, the case this year. It is a brand new drop-off log form for every donor. Also, something that I think you all are so busy serving and leading at the drop-offs that you forget to sometimes record your own volunteer hours. And while you're a year-round volunteer with us, the ministry is still asking that that short-term volunteer form be filled out even by our year-round volunteers to account for the manpower hours that it takes to do National Collection Week and do it well. So please make sure that you and all of the volunteers serving at locations do fill out those forms. And then, um, as you'll see on the screen now, gifts in kind is another thing to touch base on. There is a significant difference for gifts in kind this year. Um, we will no longer be having the CDODO gift in kind reporting form to fill out that you have had in years past. This year, all GIK will be accepted as anonymous. Most donors tend to go that route anyway. If you happen to encounter a donor who is expecting that special form because they have done that in years past, if you'll please just jot down their information on something with what they donated, and you can email that to me, you can put a note in your closure packet, whatever, we just do not have the capacity for the team at headquarters to process all of the forms that are not, that the, that the donors don't necessarily have to have because they are short an admin person right now at this very busy time of year. Um, the filler item label, you just stick that on the outside of the carton. You do not have to sort your gifts and kind donations you receive in any manner. Just put it all in a box. We will deal with sorting it at the processing center and affix the filler label to the outside of that. Next up, we are going to talk about the Excel drop-off log. Um, the Excel drop-off log, for those who are new, is simply an Excel document that we sent a template to in the email today, and that's also in box, where somebody is in charge at the drop-off location of entering the information that Donor groups are filling out on the paper drop-off log forms to put into the Excel log for the area team to use and also for the regional office to use for important things like speaker tours and a recruitment events and different opportunities that we have to involve our donor public in special Operation Christmas Child opportunities throughout the year. And so the biggest change that has happened with this this year is we are not going to be recording individual, like individual family donors 
on the Excel drop-off form. Please hear me loud and clear on this. They still have to fill out the drop-off log form for headquarters. The change is a change in donor information keeping regulations for what we can keep in the field and at the regional office about individual donors. This does not affect churches. This does not affect groups and project leaders. We're talking about Sally Sue that walks in and drops off two boxes or 25 boxes that are just Sally Sue's. We're not going to put that Sally Sue's personal information on the drop-off log form. We are going to record Sally Sue as anonymous, as an individual, and as her total shoeboxes that she dropped off, so it is being included in the count on that, but just not her address, her phone number, her email address because of these changes. This is very clearly spelled out on the Excel drop-off log instructions with an example highlighted in yellow for what the anonymous is supposed to look like when you're typing it into the Excel drop-off log this year. So please look carefully at the instructions this year because some of that information is new. And also please use the Excel drop-off log template that was sent with the email today and discard any template that you have kept from previous years going, oh, we can just use this one to fill in our stuff next year because it's going to be wrong. So please take care of paying attention to that fact. Okay, next is the final Monday of National Collection Week is the busiest, biggest, and most important day of National Collection Week um, because this is when, as you know, your drop-offs are going to be coming to bring their boxes to you along with their closure packets. The best piece of advice that we can give you to make this as smooth as possible is to schedule each of your drop-off coordinators to come at a different hour time slot of the final Monday so that you have time to look at their closure packet information with them, ask them any questions, recount any boxes that are necessary before they just drop and go. If you've got five places dropping off at the same time, there's no way that you can have that direct personal interaction. And we want to remind you that the reason that this is important is because the central drop-off team leader is responsible for the accuracy of the drop-off team leader's closure packet. So you are the last set of eyes that is going over that information before it lands in our office. And the farther that a problem gets moved down the food chain, the worse it becomes. I have no hope of reconciling discrepancies on box counts when it hits my office when all I'm looking at is paperwork and I don't have the physical boxes attached to that paperwork. You have the benefit of the cartons in front of you, the drop-off team leader in front of you, and the paperwork in front of you. So please, um, just for the good of the whole process running smoothly for your last day going well, and for me to not be calling people and bothering them around Thanksgiving, please meet with each person individually to get this figured out. And then the last thing on this slide, is just the importance of email communication at this time of year. As I said, there's 59 of you, just the central drop-off team leaders, not counting logistics coordinators, not counting area coordinators. We have to use email to communicate very important stuff. And so please make a point to check your email regularly, both leading up to National Collection Week as we start to email usually about once a week with something and after, because if I do run into questions on paperwork or totals or anything, email is going to be one of the best ways for me to communicate with you. So I appreciate you paying attention to that. Okay, we're going to focus on two very important pieces of the closure packet real quick. Summary sheets. And just want to make sure that we make this super clear that for you as a central drop-off team leader, there are two separate summary sheets that you're going to complete. One is the collection network summary sheet that you'll see a picture of on the left-hand side of the slide that's being shown. That records all of your drop-off locations. And for those of you who have been around for years, you will notice a difference this year. We did not fill out collection network summary sheets for each of your central drop-offs. 
what I have found in the past three years is that so many people are not using the one that we've typed and provided to try to, you know, make it a little bit easier for you and for us that it wasn't worth us going ahead to fill that out because we know that the headquarters is sending a blank collection network summary sheet with the rest of your paperwork. And it just seems like the default is people go to that form they get with that instead of the one that we've emailed. So we're going to roll with that this year. So I really need you to make sure that you're listing all of the central drop-offs that you, I'm sorry, all of the drop-offs that feed into your central drop-off on this form. And you are totaling it. And you're going to see at the bottom there is a spot for your count versus the bill of lading count. Those two numbers should match. And I hope that you will do everything you can to make it match. If for some reason you have done everything you can to make it match and it doesn't, the bill of lading number is what we're going with. And I need you to, on the bottom of that form, there's a couple of lines to explain where you think the discrepancy came from as best as you might know. Anything you can tell me is helpful. The summary sheet on the right-hand side, this every central drop-off and every drop-off receives this. This is the most important form for you to go over with those drop-off team leaders when they bring the closure packet to you. Because this has the count, the total for their shoe boxes, but also at the bottom has their count of their total number of volunteers, their total number of volunteer hours, how many cartons they have returned that are empty, how many cartons they have used. We need all those blanks filled in because my team has to enter all of those numbers into a database. And you can imagine with 390 packets, we do not have time to have to add volunteer hours on 60 different volunteer forms for one location. There is just not time to do that in the two weeks that we have. So please make sure the numbers are here and if they're not, it's a great teaching moment to set your drop-off team leader down at a table and ask them to pull out those forms and to go back and fix it so that the error doesn't come farther down the line. So I appreciate your assistance on both of those things. Final slide, and I'll make this really quick. The bill of lading um, is extremely important. And this year, more than ever before, we are asking you to please complete it on my OCC, if at all humanly possible. This again, A, it's easier for the ministry overall, and we've been wanting to make this transition more fully for years. But this year, it's more important than ever because the logistics team is down an admin person who usually handles the bulk of this. And Davey Clemmer's name, who you'll see in that box, with a phone number and email if you don't have internet access to do it online. He is one person and there's almost 5,000 drop-off locations nationwide. So total, that's not CDOs, but that's total drop-offs. He is brand new this year. We want him to have a good first season. So please, if you can report it on my OCC, do so, because when you do the bill of lading on my OCC, it also reports your trailer overall. It's one and done when you do it online. There is a great training video that was included in the email we sent out this morning with details about how to complete this form well. And I'm sure your regional point of contact will be able to assist you if you have any questions with it. So that is the end of what I had to say tonight. Thank you so much for your attention and for your partnership. We are very, very blessed by each and every one of you. Hi, this is Tracy again, and I have the privilege of praying with you all before we hang up on the call, and I do want to let you know that after we pray, um, the regional team will stay on the call so that if you have additional questions, now is the time that you can ask them. So let's pray. First of all, I want to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord. For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Your labor is not in vain. Father God, I just praise you for this logistics team on the call right now. What an amazing team of people we have. Volunteers who dedicate so much time and effort and organizational skills, Father, to serving in this ministry. I just praise you for them right now, Father God. I thank you that their work is not in vain. I thank you, Father, that... Um, 
you provide a way for them to be enthusiastic in what they do and to for their passion to show through and father for their um, eagerness to serve with excellence father god i just praise you for that i ask that you go before us during this collection season father and help us to serve you with that excellence and i pray this in your son's name amen so now if you are finished and don't have any questions feel free to hang up at this time but if you do have questions like i said the regional team is on and we're eager to answer them thanks guys good job hey tracy this, this is, is shannon mcgonagall go ahead Hello? i'm sorry this is shannon mcgonagall i just wanted to clarify did i understand on the drop-off log that if it oh, sally it. sue comes in we don't have to put sally sue 100 connor Lane, blah 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 just put anonymous and then six boxes on her paper drop-off log, you put her name and information. On the Excel spreadsheet, you put anonymous. Gotcha. Volunteer okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, just, I was a little confused on that one, so I wanted to make sure. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Tracy, is that just for some kind of enhanced privacy considerations? It is, yes. Well, there have been some new privacy laws that have come out and are about to come out, and so... We have been um, cautioned that we really need to protect the individual donor. Now, if that individual donor aligns with a church, then we're okay to use that information. But if they're just there donating individually, their their donation is just like a, it's a gift in kind. It's just it has a monetary value, and so we cannot maintain that information locally. Got it. Thank you. And Wendy, feel free to jump in. Any so, other questions? So Tracy, this is Joaquin. So will we have access to that individual donor information in the future? And the reason I ask is because that's a source of information for us in our recruiting effort. Right. I'll answer and then I'll let the other the rest of the team join in um, because I saw, um, Alan, you had a great idea about making a copy of it. And we do want you to make copies of your drop off logs so that if they get lost in transit, we have them. But we don't want you to maintain that information on your individuals. However, if you have a great promotions person at that table who is greeting those donors as they come in and somebody set, talks to them about, well, can I contact you in the future? about possible year-round volunteering and use the information that way, that's a different conversation than the information we collect strictly for their drop-off log. Does that sound reasonable to you, Wendy? Shelley? Yes, that's a good explanation of it. it. It's a definite change this year, but again, if a project leader is dropping off on behalf of a church, that project leader, we're fine to have their information. If we're really talking about individual donors or individual families that come in that are not attached to a church or group. Okay, hang up. Question. This is Brees. I have uh, one question. Yes. Um, so if we're not supposed to keep the information locally, does that mean, okay, we make our copies of all our drop-off logs in case the um, – the information gets lost in the mail, but are we supposed to be destroying those copies afterwards? For the individuals, yes. Okay. Unless you've had that conversation and they've given you permission to contact them at another time, you could have like a sign-up sheet for that. Okay, but otherwise we need to uh, destroy, destroy the, the drop individual yes. drop-off log copies. Yes, because that okay. has their gift and kind of information on it. Okay. What's a recommended holding period for the copies? I have to have the closure packet submitted to headquarters by the middle of December. And so if you haven't heard from me by December 15th, you're fine to destroy it. Okay. So we don't have to keep uh, copies for a year or two? No, ma'am. That's correct. You do not have to keep copies for multiple years. Oh, okay, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Hi, this is Jan. I'm with the Northwest Georgia Central Drop-Off. This is my first year, and I have a question about the summary sheet. Okay. Uh, and the picture that I'm looking at, it shows a summary sheet. And at the top of the location, it has C for Central Drop-Off. I thought that that summary sheet was for each drop-off location for what they uh, – what's been dropped off each day during collection week, and then they turn that into the central office, I mean, to the central drop-off? That is correct, but you also have a summary sheet for your central drop-off because individual donors and churches and groups can be bringing their boxes to your central drop-off. In addition to the fact that your drop-offs that feed into you will bring all of their boxes to you by that final Monday. So for the, central, for the central drop-off summary sheet, you put the C and your zip code in it for your location, just individual group and church boxes that have come through your location. And then the summary sheets the drop-offs are filling out has a D for drop-off and their zip code on each of their summary sheets for the boxes they're bringing to you. So our location is both. We are the drop-off location for our area, and we are the central drop-off for northwest Georgia. So right. You, you are just a central drop-off location that because you are that, individual donors, churches, and groups are bringing to you as well. A central drop-off is a central drop-off. A drop-off is a drop-off. The difference is a central drop-off both receives boxes from the public in addition to the drop-offs in your network feeding their boxes through your location to get on the truck. So your summary sheet has what you get if you're thinking in this term as you being a drop-off, and then the rest of the sheets are coming with the closure packets for the drop-off locations that are feeding into you from your network. Does that help? Okay, so... But what I'm calling my area churches, when they send their boxes to me each day, I record that on the summary sheet. But is my location a C for central or a D for drop-off? Your That's location on all of your personal locations paperwork is a C for central drop-off. You are never telling me the drop-off paperwork that has to have Ds on it until you're double-checking it when they bring it to you on the final Monday. Okay. So I'm, I'm always a C. <laughs> yes, you are always a C. I'm, I'm not a D. I'm always a C. And then my volunteers that are working, they'll be a C for central drop-off, not yes. a D for... Drop Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. So many little things to, to decipher here. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, um... I'm going to go ahead and close us out, but I do want you to know if anybody has any further questions, please feel free to ask your area coordinator or your regional point of contact, and we'll be happy to work with you one-on-one. -on -one. But good questions and good call, and thank you all for being with us. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank good you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.